And a very big good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to Ask X Factor Live. We are here for the next hour with you. As you can see, we have a beautiful smorgasbord of gorgeous women <laughs> looking at you this morning from around <laughs> Australia. Um, welcome, um, come in, uh, grab a seat. Uh, hope you've got a cup of tea. If you haven't, you've got a couple of minutes while we welcome you. Run off and quickly grab yourself a cup of tea and settle in for a really Rich. lovely morning this morning here on Ask X Factor Live. So welcome to those who are joining us. Good morning, Asha. Good morning, Madison, Marianne, Millie, Pam, Robbie. Great. Thanks for joining us here this morning. This is week nine of our 18-week Ask X Factor Live program. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, that's because us, uh, the X Factor Collective only really launched about 10 weeks ago um, in its current beautiful form with 30 foundation members, great consultants and coaches from around Australia uh, who care about working with you on <clears throat> achieving your social mission. Uh, so we have a range of change maker coaches in our community in the X Factor Collective and this is our first time that we have a panel event on Ask X Factor Live so bear with us while we work it all out but we're excited to have um, four amazing women here today to answer your questions um, and help you get on with achieving your social mission. Um, so welcome everyone settling in here now. There's a chat box to the side. If you just want to pop a note in there and let us know where you're dialing in from. We are here, Ruth and I are here in Williamstown. We've got Jodie and Annette in different parts of Melbourne this morning. And Emily is dialing in from Noosa. So feel free to pop and test that chat box there and let us know where you're dialing in from. Welcome. Hello from Cairns. Hello from Corindai. And we're starting to get people letting us know where they're coming in from. Fantastic. Great to have you here. Um, so good morning and my name is Julia Keady. I am the host of Ask X Factor Live and also the proud uh, founder and CEO of the X Factor Collective. Um, for those who don't know me, I've been a part of the social impact sector for the last 10 years um, and a highlight of that being the CEO of the Australian Women Donors Network. Um, after which I say I became an accidental consultant. Uh, didn't plan to be a consultant, but absolutely loved it and had the privilege of working with a number of different types of change makers. Um, and by change makers, I mean people that are basically working on something, a social or an environmental or community impact mm -hmm. that they feel really deeply about. And that could be someone running a social purpose organisation, a philanthropic donor, um, a business owner who's looking at what their business can do to have more of a social impact. So lots of different types mm. of um, clients. And then I was also working with lots of different types of consultants and coaches. And over that time, I could see that there was ways, different ways that we could make life easier for um, our clients in the social impact space, as well as us as consultants and coaches. So I decided that we needed a collective um, and that we needed a community where you could find like-hearted and like-minded people to work with on your projects. Um, so that's what we're doing. We launched the X Factor Collective. We've kicked off with 30 foundation members. You can come and work with any of us at any given time. We are building out across 300 areas of specialization. Um, so at any given time, if it's a legal question or a PR question, mm -hmm or strategy or whatever it might be, you can come here um, and find someone to work with. So Ask X Factor Live is not a webinar as such. There's no big sell at the end. Um, it's free because we believe that these are the types of programs that we need in our community to help make life easier to be a social change maker. So we're here every Wednesday morning. It's such a privilege to showcase the amazing knowledge in our community. Um, and connecting in with you as well and hearing about your story. Um, so we're here for you today to answer your questions. We do, we have already received a number of questions and our change maker coaches have prepared some tools and some tips and some, some great stories of clients that they've worked with as well. So we're gonna hear all about that over the next hour. So before I introduce everybody, just to uh, let you know, we are here for the next hour. Uh, we will be recording this session mm -hmm. and then we're chopping up the session into little mini episodes which will all be available on our YouTube channel over the next couple of weeks. So we'll send you links for that 
Um, and you can also dip into some of the other episodes that we have had here over the last eight weeks. Um, if the link drops out uh, in the chat box there, you'll see that there's two phone numbers and a code. So if the link drops out, don't stress, just dial in. Um, and I'm just gonna pop that up on your screen. If you want to, you can just do a screenshot of that as well. If you can't hear us or your link drops out, there's the phone numbers and the code to listen in. So hopefully we won't lose you. Um, and a very good morning to those who are just joining us now, Diana and John, great to have you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. And where's everyone? Sydney, Creswick, Ballarat, all over the countryside. Great, great to see. Um, so, well, after that big introduction, mm. let's get into it, um, shall we? So today I'm delighted to have, as I mentioned, four of the Changemaker coaches from the X Factor Collective uh, here to share their experiences with you and to answer your questions as well. So I'm going to introduce them one by one to you now and then we're going to jump into some questions. So the first lovely lady I'd like to introduce you to is Emily Paolo, who I had the pleasure of meeting, what, about 10 years ago, I think, Em? Mm -hmm. um, Em's been a change maker coach for five years. She works with a lot of people um, in their 20s and 30s and really has a mission on helping young people find their purpose. Uh, she's the founder of the Collective Potential. Uh, we have that uh, collective idea um, we share that idea of the collective together and she's run workshops for over 10,000 people um, around Australia. So hi Emily, Hello, thanks for jumping in here today. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to Annette Herstel. Um, Annette and I again probably met what, 10 odd years ago. As you can see, I'm just collecting all my favourite people um, <laughs> in Australia for the collective. <laughs> Um, Annette's worked in social impact and philanthropy for 20 years. Um, she's worked with a number of philanthropic donors, social entrepreneurs, um, and she also has her own social tech startup enterprise, which is a big game changer in the whole system change space. So an incredible woman, um, works with a range of um, clients in a coaching capacity, and we're delighted to have you here today, Annette. <laughs> Excellent. Can you just test your volume there, darling? Yeah, hi. Great, excellent. Just couldn't hear you then. Yeah. Um, next to my left here is the lovely Ruth Jones. Um, Ruth works with a number of social purpose organisations, um, boards and CEOs, as well as philanthropic donors, um, and has been a major contributor worldwide to the growth of the venture partner movement, both here in Australia, overseas. Um, Ruth and I met in Seattle about 10 years ago, and I blame Ruth for the last 10 years of being <laughs> very fortuitous for both of us. In the, in the yeah. philanthropy space, yeah. yeah. Um, an inspirational woman to, to work with and to know. So great to have you here. And finally, we have Jodie Wilmer. Jodie and I again probably met about 10 years ago. I think something was in the water about 10 years ago. Um, and Jodie's worked in the social impact sector for the last 20 years. Um, and she, for a long time, she was the CEO of Travellers Aid and took that organisation through an incredible transformation mm. um, and modernisation. Um, when she's not helping boards on matters of governance, she's working with social entrepreneurs to either help them get them started or to scale up their ventures. Um, so welcome to you, Jodie. Thank you, Julia. Excellent. All right, so let's get into mm. it, shall we, ladies? Get into some of this great content. Um, this first question I'd love to hear from all of you, if that's okay. Um, you've all been working with social change makers for a number of years, um, people who have a big idea for change and, and who pursue it with great vigour, whether they work in a charity or a social enterprise or a purpose-driven business um, or within a mm. community group. What do you all see as the, you know, one or two defining characteristics of being a social change maker today? I might kick off with you, Jodie, if that's okay. Absolutely. I think some of the defining characteristics are people who have a vision and passion, um, and, but more importantly, that they can actually channel it for good instead of evil. We know that there's a lot of people who, you know, are sometimes a bit misguided about their passion and enthusiasm. So change makers to me are people who really want to, you know, bring around change in a positive sense for you know, both as an individual and a community. Beautiful. 
Emily, how about for you? Um, I would say mine's bravery and resourcefulness. You have to have, you have to be brave to pull it all together. You do, you have to find that deep within you, act despite fear and get it out there. But I also think the resourcefulness of when people tell me that they can't do it or they don't have the money, somehow I make it work, but I think that comes down to resourcefulness. Mm. Absolutely. You can make it work. You make it work. Absolutely. It's that burning drive, isn't it? To just mm -hmm. regardless, there's no, nothing gets in my way. And again, the bravery to ask people for help every time with support. That's very true. Yeah. You, Ruth? I think it's preparedness to take a risk. Uh, and it's hard to take risks. And here I'm not talking about being reckless mm -hmm. or foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about a calculated risk where you've looked at the options and you think if this, if I can carry this off, it's really going to make a difference to the mission and the potential to reach our goals. So I'm going to take a risk and it might not work. Mm. That's a big one, isn't so it? So in fact, it's also a readiness to embrace the, potent the possibility of failure. Yes. And that's, that can be, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gut wrenching as we all, we all see that with our clients, don't we? Yeah. And how about for you, Annette? Yeah, look, I think similar, I would just say there is some sort of thing that happens where the status quo, the ordinary day job is just not going to cut it and there's something that they can't let themselves off the hook, even though signing up for this commitment to social change or environmental change is going to be a path that's going to be strewn with risk and mystery and failure and difficulty. It's almost like they'd rather that in the pursuit of their passion and the pursuit of that knowledge now that, you know, this is a world which requires us when, you know, that there's a lot that needs change. And in that knowledge, they can't like sign up for a normal day job. It's like a, a real sense of passion that's willing to put themselves on the hook and maybe be uncomfortable in many, many ways, but that's just what they need to do. So, and that's an incredibly wonderful thing to witness in someone but it's also not, not always the easiest path, you know. Especially when you're trying to explain that to a partner or family members as well, when they're saying, you know, just why don't you just consider a day job for a while, you yeah. know, rather than this burning social issue that you want to, you know, yeah. get behind. Yeah. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Um, please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box there. Um, we will jump onto your questions um, throughout the course of the next hour. There's a Q&A box that you can click and you can also ask your questions anonymously if you like. That's completely fine. Um, the next question I have is for, um, for, Emily, for Emily and Jody, if that's okay. And I just want to get a sense of, you know, some of the inspiring, um, you know, what inspires you? You know, who inspires you? And can you tell us briefly about a change maker client that you've worked with that that really stands out you know as inspiration to you as a change maker um, and to others so might start with you Jody, with a, an example oh thanks Julie look every single client who I work with inspires me in all sorts of ways and I think um, it's not just when things are going well and there's actually making a, a massive impact it's it's the personal journey and it's and growth that people experience that also I think is the most satisfying mm -hmm. um, and one of the most inspiring clients who I've worked with as a change maker coach is a woman called Tracy um, from Testigo and uh, you know she founded an organization a permaculture NGO in Africa um, basically after going there on a holiday and finding that people needed help in a drought and uh, it's now been running eight years and she has dealt with a lot of hardship. Um, she's built really amazing relationships with the local Maasai communities in a very respectful way. And she's brought people on that journey um, to now make it a, a really um, sustainable organisation, but also sustainable from the point of view of food, security and, uh, and you know, cultural integrity. So she's one of my faves. I mean, I've got heaps of faves, but, you know, she stands out as one of the top. And she's a, she's a Melbourne um, girl too, isn't she, Jodie? Tracy? That's correct. So she's, she's from Melbourne and, uh, and, you know, she's back in, in Africa at the moment, but 
you know, we, we were connected by a mutual friend who said, you know what, I think maybe you'd be able to um, help each other out. And, and she's certainly, I've learned a lot from her as working with her, but also, you know, I, I know that I've been able to help her navigate through the really tricky journey of um, being able to scale up to be able to bring new people on board and, and create systems to be able to make uh, the organisation more sustainable. Fantastic. That's a great one. Emily, how about you? Uh, mine um, what happened to be a young girl. I was out in um, Bendigo and um, ultimately the end result of this is um, her life has changed so much um, and she's now thinking about how can she give back. And I think sometimes the best kind of stories come from people who are facing adversity but then realise there's a real gift in the adversity to pay it forward. I think we've all experienced that in our life or we wouldn't be in these industries in a way. So there is a real uh, yin and yang to that. So I found her on the corner of a street. I was doing a road trip trying to find out where the gaps in the health system are. And in this moment, in a very short period, I'll tell you this, she ran across the road, the road screaming, I've had enough. Um, and she tried to unfortunately throw herself in front of the car to kill herself. Now, trigger warning for those out there, but it ends with a really beautiful story, so stay with me. That in the end, I said to her, you're allowed, you know, no one knew what to do in this deserted street in Bendigo. And she looked at me and she said, am I? And in that moment, I progressed to say to her, well, what, you need purpose and meaning. Tell me in six months where you want to be. Of course, she wants to be with the kids, have freedom in her life. So meaning and purpose is a big part of what I do. And so over a six month period, even though the police were against her getting the kids back, the law courts, the domestic violence, the services, like I learned everything I needed to know about the gaps in the system that day. But she rings me only um, a month ago and says, I've got the kids. Without the road trip, no one would have been there. It saved my life. And so now I want to go forward and change the way that women look at domestic violence or even just knowing that it isn't just domestic violence, it's having that belief in yourself that you can live your dreams. And she just epitomises to me that once you teach and educate what that can do to really empower someone to then go and impact her local community. Mm. So isn't that a beautiful story? Mm. Incredible. 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 Yeah. yeah. And, and we can all probably connect mm. in with that yes. with ourselves of what we've all faced and why we care to um, coach and mentor and support others um, as well. Do you know, what is that thing in us that we know that life's short <laughs> at the end of the day? It's a short time that we're here to have a great time and, and make a difference. Yeah. Wow, Emily, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to keep talking then for a second. That kind of got me, that one. You know what I mean? It's always the story that really matters, the life-changing moment like that was that changed my life because I was like, wow, oh, I am actually working with change makers, not just individuals. I'm working with people who impact their community. And she might be young, but there's still adults who are 30, 40, 50 in their side-out programs who are feeling the same and wanting to give back. So wow. Inspired me that moment, believe me. And and everyone comes from all walks of life and locations mm. and ages. And you know, it's it's interesting to see people that have worked a job for 30, 40 years and saying, actually, I want to back myself mm. now and on an idea that I have and I've long had it, and we're in this environment now that, that people can. So yes. You know, it doesn't matter where people are coming from. It's it's what the burning thing inside them is. Yeah. So it's going to be great, Emily, to see what this um, lady from Bendigo does and goes on to do because, um, you know, that's where the real change, we've seen that with Rosie mm. Batty, didn't we? Do you know what Rosie Batty was able to actually bring to the world after what she endured? And that's the, that's the key point that has changed me because we have the ability to support those people to flourish, to thrive and to do that. And I think we forget that linchpin that we can become when we design those programs or at least uh, other mm. people and then, just, and then we walk away. So I love that. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Um, let's move on to, on to another question and hear from Ruth and Annette. Um, someone asked me recently, like, you know, what is a change maker coach? Is it like a life coach? You know, is it like a a business coach, you know, what is it? And I said, I think it's change maker coaches of people who have been 
lead, lead change themselves and know what it's like and then can go and help coach and support others. And, you know, we're not necessarily the fan club um, in the football field. We're actually the, the coach sitting up in the box mm. and we've been working through strategy and we've been working through tools mm. um, to help you, you know, be your best on the field. Um, but we're also looking at the whole season, not just that match. And we're such a we're such a sport sporting country. I often find sporting analogies kind of land in my head. But it's it's that working with a coach where they're looking at the whole season, you know, and the goals that you've set for that whole season to get you to the grand final, mm-hmm. to get you to um, that destination, hopefully. Um, but also giving you the you know some tools along the way. And I just wanted to pick up on mm-hmm. this notion of tools because. We do collect a lot of great tools and really effective tools that we can share um, with our clients and collectively share. And I hope over the next couple of years we can build build up a library of tools that we can refer people to. Um, So I just wanted to maybe start with you, Ruth, if that's okay. Um, Tools can help to reduce the overwhelm and feeling feeling overwhelmed is often a part of, of leading change because the thing that we care about, it can be, seem so big. Um, but it's often in using sort of effective tools that we can, we can calm yes. that, we can reduce the overwhelm. And I just wanted to hear from you and then Annette on what are some of the tools that you find uh, are effective with your clients? Well, I want to start by saying that I uh, have had a number of coaches over the years, including a couple of really tough ones mm. who did not let me get away with anything. And it was a transformative uh, experience for me mm. because I often did feel overwhelmed. Uh, the fear would make me basically freeze, uh, and that's a horrible feeling. Mm. Uh, and having a really uh, a, a coach who listened and who encouraged me to uh, peel away some of my own fears allowed me to come back it allowed me to plan it allowed me to see what was the root of my anxiety Mm. and it allowed me then to be be, to take a more objective approach and plan and planning for me is the start of feeling I can do this I know what to do I know how to I know what people I need to help me I know what resources I need to put in place to actually make this happen so essentially, mm. it uh, is about change making coaching for me as a personal experience was about allowing me to move forward uh, with, with confidence. Mm. Didn't mean that I didn't have occasional lots of misgivings and doubts, but mm. nevertheless move forward. So I think that probably my response to dealing with feeling overwhelmed is I've got to talk to somebody who is objective, Mm. who's not engaged in it herself Mm. and who will help me uh, plan and think this through. Mm. Lovely. Great. Annette, how about you? What do you find that's working well with your clients? I often find that a client comes to me after gestating something for a while. It's It's a bit of a leap for them to actually say, let's do it. Um, so by the time they come, they're really full of thoughts and ideas and possibilities. So the first thing we usually do is map because it's a mutual experience where we can start. I get um, big whiteboards and we just draw pictures. We map the sector. We map their income streams. We map their questions and concerns. And it's a way for them to get everything off their chest um, and to feel that it's being captured and not lost. And it's a way for me to understand and to start um, offering my perspective and feedback. Um, and then I rest with that until, and then I will go and we'll develop like a work in progress document where you work together. So I'll go away with all of that, all of their aspirations, all of their issues, um, and map out a sequence um, of steps that I'll then take back to them. Because what I find is that most people I work with are really busy operationally, so they're just they're just treading treading the treadmill on answering their emails, writing the next funding submission um, on deadline. They're just busy operating, and the the problem is that they don't have time to be strategic. So 
They don't have time to ask those questions about where am I applying my effort for what return? And they're getting stuck down rabbit holes. And, I, and I'm able to sort of say, hang on, why are we spending all this time on this, which is only going to maybe bring this amount? What about, have you thought about that? And I think it's those fresh eyes um, on that strategic bigger picture. Mm. And then that accountability where they say, I'm going to get lost again. I'm not going to think about this for the next week. So can you hold me accountable when we speak next week? And I want you to check in that I've done these three things. Um, and that's how we sort of work week to week on that sort of, how did you go? And then often they, they say, oh, well, I got into trouble and I couldn't go forward and we troubleshoot and we keep moving. But in that sort of very ordered sequence. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I can hold that for them. They can get on with all the other stuff. And even their most kind of craziest idea is still there. Yet we don't lose it. We just put it in perspective strategically and then work through it in quite a structured way from week to week. So those are the two tools, the mapping and the work in progress that, that really anchors and creates a sense of security and then hopefully lessens the overwhelm. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And I, just picking up there on accountability, like in all my conversations with change maker coaches in the collective, one of the big things is, is that people don't know that they actually love, they end up loving the accountability. Like our clients, don't they? They yes. end up kind of going, I didn't know that I could love this level of accountability. It's actually helping me move through. And it's like, it's almost like we don't have a culture that starts off in our early years with accountability. We're just kind of thrown out into the workplace <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's a different it's different to KPIs, isn't it? So yes. having accountability in our workplace and how do we bring up that next generation with accountability, um, you know, in a beautiful way. And I think that's one of the great traits that I love about all of our change maker coaches that we can bring that in um, and the, the soft and the hard edges of, of accountability. Fun to tease out at some point, Julia, perhaps not today, about the difference between accountability and KPIs because mm. they are different, but... Mm. There's a blog post. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In a way, it's kind of like parenting. <laughs> Not that you, ever, you, ever, you want your parents to support you, but don't tell me what to do. But at the same time, when you do support me, God, I flourish. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's also why we don't want to listen to our parents, and yet at the same time, we're so glad we have them. <laughs> that's very true that's very true um we're going to pop into some more um questions in just a second you are here on ask x factor live if you're not sure where you are um and i just wanted to let you know this is an 18 week uh, pilot uh we're just really testing it there wasn't anything like this that we could find that we could have a, a knowledge sharing opportunity every week mm -hmm. um, and allow for people just to drop in ask their questions on a broad range of topics. So I just wanted to share with you what is coming up because if you're new to the X Factor Collective today or new to this idea of Ask X Factor Live, um, please feel free to check out the rest of our program. We have got three fantastic women. As you can see, I just feel like I'm collecting all of my people, um, all of my favorite people from around the country. So um, next week we have Laura Trotter who has created and sold um, online eco businesses, all with a focus on um, environmentally um, friendly um, businesses, um, helping, she was one of the first people to create a, a website where you could get eco friendly baby goods um, going back about 10 years ago. And, a, and a, an extraordinary woman, woman, one of only 30 that went to Antarctica last year on an um, environmental social change makers leadership. Um, group and she's going to be here with us. She's part of the X Factor Collective here with us next um, Wednesday. So feel free to come and ask Laura any questions to do with online business, anything to do in the environmental space. She's an incredible woman. Um, you can jump onto the website and register for that. The following week, we have another brilliant woman, Sylvia Chachia, who has been in the finance sector for 30 years and decided that she wanted to actually become a financial empowerment coach specifically helping people with the everyday finances um, and being a virtual CFO, but helping mostly with this up here mm. and money mindset. Um, and Sylvia and I met a couple of years ago and I said, we need to bring money mindset into the social impact sector because it actually, there's a whole bunch of unlocking that we need to do around some of our limiting beliefs to do with money 
um, whether we're setting something up or whether we're handing over money mm. in a partnership, that there's a lot of old baggage, money baggage sure. that we have um, in our sector. So so excited she is as well to be a part of the X Factor Collective and be in this social impact space. And then the following week we have Kate Buxton. Kate's just finished up last year as the CEO of Australian Community Philanthropy. She's been galvanising community foundations and the growth of community foundations in Australia. Um, and what I love what we're doing with Kate in three weeks time is we're looking through, we're looking at a topic called don't panic, what to do when things go wrong. <laughs> It's going to be great. We, we, we talked about it the other day. We're going to be doing what to do when things go wrong with the media, with your donors, with the board, with staff, with volunteers and with events. And Kate's just got this sort of bevy of 25 years of disasters um, that she's going to <laughs> help talk us through. It's going to be so fantastic. Um, but she's I'm got some really one. great frameworks and some really great thinking and tools and tips that you know, sometimes you don't want to find out about those tools and tips when you're in the disaster. So I encourage you to come along and have a listen to that because I think there's going to be some great gems um, in that session. But also we'll make that available on our YouTube channel so you can jump into that if you ever hit a disaster as well. You'll be able to watch Kate mm. um, down the track. So that's what's coming up. Please feel free to share the program with any of your friends, family, countrymen, colleagues. Um, we do want to spread the word as far and wide. It's a beautiful program with beautiful people, um, as you can see. So coming back to these beautiful mm -hmm. people here today, um, let's jump back into another question. And please feel free if you've got questions. We're here for another 30 minutes um, to answer, ask any questions in the Q&A box there. Um, I want to jump into trends. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't even hear this word, a social change maker coach. Do you know, you wouldn't hear a social impact consultant. We have a lot of, you know, new things that are changing in this space all the time. And I just wanted to hear from Jodie and Ruth about what you're seeing with major trends in recent years with the change maker clients that you're working with. I might start with you first, Ruth, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. I think that you can never underestimate what can happen when people begin to understand what is behind the social issues that are in the news, mm. which means that uh, finding a way in which to educate people about the, the, the core causes of social challenges is really important. So how do you, so one of the trends is that we have to respond to is how do we educate people in a way in which they are open to learning? Mm. And second, I think that uh, people in their 50s and over have time, money, energy, wisdom, experience, and the ability and desire to engage. Mm. And how are we, as people in the social space, uh, connecting with uh, those people mm -hmm. and all of the resources that they can bring to uh, the social challenge, the biggest social challenge of our time, and and a growing a growing yeah. number is growing. There's a it's tremendous like, number. Yeah. I mean, look at the number of people. I mean, you know, what is it? Sixty is the new forty, uh, and yet how many people, uh, fifty five and over, uh, have the time? I mean, a huge numbers of them mm -hmm. have time, energy, mm -hmm. and ability to engage. And I think we've got a responsibility to look at how we actually engage them. Great, fantastic. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. How we're going to engage them? Absolutely. Share with us in your chat box there if you're what you're seeing as well. Um, what what you're noticing that's changing in your work over the last couple of years. Um, Jody, love your thoughts on what are you seeing in this area? I think that the main thing I'm seeing is that um, there's never been such a better and easier time to start a business or to be an entrepreneur. And uh, so the barriers to entry in most cases are fairly low. That means that for a lot of people, um, you can register a domain name, you can you know, pop online and develop a website or an online course, or you can connect with people all around the world who you've never met face to face, which provides these enormous opportunities to sort of connect with like-minded people. The challenge we find is that a lot of people are um, often overwhelmed because they've got all these different ideas. They're often, as Annette said before, um, 
you know, working on too many activities. And I think um, where we've got a lot of people now who want to, you know, actually make lasting difference and they want to leave legacy is, you know, how can we do that in a way that maintains your mental health? You know, a lot of people who are entrepreneurs um, suffer from burnout and um, mental health issues. Um, and that's often not talked about. It's not talked about in the not-for-profit sector or for-purpose for-profit sector. So I think, you know, with all that ability to, to um, rapidly um, prototype and minimum viable product and things like this, we also have to balance that with, you know, looking after ourselves and sort of doing it in a way that's aligned with your values um, and also connecting with people who are going to help you on that journey um, as a co-founder or coaches, um, and, and you know other partners who want to see you be successful, um, and do that in a way that is you know not stressful. And that's I guess what we all do as change maker coaches is help people reduce the overwhelm and the stress in you know taking this bright spark idea to making it actually happen. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic, Emily. I I know that um, I hadn't dubbed you in for this question about trends, but I'm just curious if you might be able to just share with us you're, you're traveling around the country all the time seeing the next generation who are finishing school living in communities in their in their 20s and working in the communities in rural and, and remote australia what are you seeing just i should have dobbed you in for this question at the outset but from a, a wider traveling perspective my first instinct is um i think you were the one who said it to me actually location dependent um I'm actually seeing that a lot of people, this digital nomads, that that uh, you can do this from wherever you want if you're willing to sacrifice the house, the home, um, the lot, the mod cons that we somehow think we need. If you're up for the life of minimalism and that sort of freedom you get from the travelling, that you you find that when you're out there, you, you, a lot of the younger ones in particular and families. Um, are out on the road as change makers developing their service or product to the world and they move around with it. Mm, mm. So I found that to be really interesting because, of course, I, I was that and then I met many of them and then I created my program based on road tripping. <laughs> so um, that's one that I think is kind of really exciting and breaks the cultural norm of what it is um, to do this work in the world too. Mm. And it's not just the digital nomads at, at that end of the age spectrum. It's, you know, people like no. my parents who are in the grey nomad, the grey digital nomads <laughs> with their iPads and, you know. Yeah, I, I think there is a myth that when you meet me that it is only just young people, but I promise you, like, our calls like this last night were 50-50 of, Wow. Older and younger and maybe because I'm growing up into the mature woman I am um, I'm attracting now but uh, I think that I'm really seeing a, a, yeah the older group out there um, and they're almost like yeah of course we are <laughs> yeah, that's it. And that to what Ruth's saying before about you know this with people that have got time they've got the talent, that, Ruth. You know, they've, they've often got the resources as well to be able to do you know the new 40 I would agree fantastic I, I want to myth bust it because I hear it every day <laughs> good love the myth busting that's a whole nother episode <laughs> Let's move on to some questions, some other questions we've had come in from the last couple of days. We received a question from Asha on email over the last couple of days. I think Asha's here with us this morning. Um, and Ruth's offered to answer this question yeah. uh, for you, Asha. Asha's question is, is, I have an idea and want to start discussing it with people to get their opinions yes. um, or their advice. Um, however, how do I safeguard my idea from people who may use it themselves or tell other people out of context of assisting me to achieve my goal? Well, first of all, congratulations, Asha, on having a, a good idea. I mean, we need, we need them. Uh, but look, unless it's a scientific or technological or business innovation that can somehow be trademarked or patented, essentially, you've got to if you have a good idea about that can bring about social change, you've got to talk about it in order to bring people on board with it, to stress test it, 
to bring on the board the people who will support it, mm. fund it, staff it, uh, expand it. So I think this is one of those times when you're going to have to take that calculated risk and start talking and sharing it with people who who will, I mean, and, and here, choose, choose sensibly the people who you discuss it with, mm. not the people who are going to poo-poo it or say, oh, that's, you know, what do you, what do you reckon? Why, why on earth would you want to do that? Talk to the people who are going to listen and help you think through its implications and make it a better idea. There's, there's really no idea that can't be improved about, by being shared with smart, thoughtful mm. people. Mm. So that's my advice, Asha. Uh, it's time to bring your baby out into the wider world. Can I add something to that? Go for Please. it. I, I, I faced a similar um, question, Asha, when I was doing my startup because it was a really good idea and I was a little bit concerned or nervous about how to stress test it without necessarily giving the idea away. And so what I, I had is I had a confidentiality agreement by my side and I had the discretion to use that if I felt necessary. In the end, I never used it, but it was nice to know that I had it. Um, point. And... Um, because someone said to me, you know, you've got to kind of trust people. And I think people are pretty busy in their lives and, and with their own ideas. And so the chance of them taking your idea and scaling it and staffing it and um, commercialising it is kind of, I mean, who's got that space in their life to do that, right? So it's kind of unusual that that would happen. Um, but also in the Lean Startup methodology, they say that um, you shouldn't... Um, give your idea away in the first meeting, what you should be doing is talking to potential customers or funders about their problems. And you've got your idea, but not necessarily to start with your idea, but to start by questioning what their pain points are and what they might need support with. Um, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, would my idea be the thing? Um, mm. But that thing about um, customer interviews, trying to find product market fit, is really fundamental to the Lean Startup. And I'd recommend um, have a look at that. There's some free online courses, Udacity does it, um, around that taking an idea through to inception in terms of when is it gonna be ready to commercialize or launch through customer interviews and product market fit. Really good resource, I used it a lot, very helpful in this question, yeah. That's great, thank you Annette, thank you Ruth. Asha, uh, feel free to let us know if that helps you um, or if you want any clarification around that, just pop that into the chat box there. Um, we do have a couple of other questions, Asha's just said that was great ladies, thank you, excellent. You're most welcome, please drop in anytime Asha so we can help you along your way developing that idea, we'd love to hear how you get on. Go um, Asha. Go Asha. <laughs> get out there girl. Ash has just said, what was the name of the resource again? Annette, can you say that again? Um, the guy, the, the founder of the of Startup Methodology, Steve Blank, and the online free course, I think it's run through either Udacity or Udemy, so U-D-E-M-Y or U-D-A-C-I-T-Y, I can't remember which one, but they're both free online courses. And if you go Steve Blank, Lean Startup Methodology, Beautiful course, all done through cartooning. So super accessible and you can just do it module by module, seven minutes at a time. Really That's good stuff. Right. Good stuff. Right. We'll put that on the, um, you'll get an email follow up um, mm -hmm. tonight as well. And we'll put a link on, on that because it's great to share all of these tools. And, and, and Asha, please feel free that, um, to stay a part of the X Factor Collective community. Do you know, the, the whole idea is that you can dip in and out of here um, as you need it with programs like this and we're going to be developing a lot more um, next year so stay around and um, let us know how we can help make life easier for you on your mission with that as well thank you um, we have a question that's come in from um, fingers crossed says Asha found it thanks Annette <laughs> awesome we have a question that's come in from Diana here um, just in the last couple of minutes as well we might jump across to that question which is, are, you, are we, are you seeing an increased investment in change-making business and activities? And what are the sources of this investment? 
So are we seeing, Diana, I understand this is, are we seeing um, an increase in people investing in social impact businesses and social entrepreneurs? Just maybe pop a note in the chat box if that's, if we're on the right track um, with your question. Yes, that's it. Thank you, says Diana. So yeah, what are we seeing in terms mm. of um, increased support and investment um, behind social entrepreneurs? Jodie, what have you been seeing? Oh, there's heaps of great programs, especially being run by um, different innovation hubs and tech startups and, um, you know, some for newly arrived migrants, some for women, some a mixture of everybody. And so I think um, I'm seeing a lot of investment in the training, in the tools, in the steps to develop a social impact or an impact um, business. Uh, I think that's a good, wise investment because a lot of people who, you know, start to leap ahead and try to ask, you know, for investment, haven't maybe got the fundamentals right. Um, so, um, you know, you can Google search those um, and we can maybe share them later as well. So there's lots of incubators, there's lots of mentoring. Um, there are some social impact investors in Australia. A lot of them are looking for programs or activities that align with the sustainable development goals uh, in particular. Um, but I see a lot of people who, who jump to the investment side who haven't really worked out, you know, is it a viable product or, or business yeah. to start with? And I'd really encourage people to sort of work on that bit first because I've also worked with some, some people who've had huge amounts of investment and haven't necessarily spent it wisely. They come to me sort of at the end, oh, we're running out of money, now we need to get around the investment. No, you've got to cut your costs and you've got to have a business model that works that people actually want to buy, not propped up by grants or funding. Yeah. That's very true. Does that help, Diana? Um, I'll probably just mention as well, there's a great resource called Social Change Central um, set up by Jay Balkan. I'm not sure if you know of who they are, Diana, but very worthwhile mm. subscribing to Social Change Central. They have a weekly, I think, or a bi-weekly email with all different opportunities as they come mm. up. Um, there's also new legislation that's just passed on equity crowdfunding for businesses, for social businesses. So that's a new development just in the last two weeks. I think it's only in Victoria for equity crowdfunding for, um, for social impact businesses. So, and there's also the new uh, legislation around um, social purchasing. Uh, in Victoria, which social procurement, social yeah. procurement, which that's I hope it. that we'll see expanding to all the other state governments because that's a, a great opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's another great one to look at, Diana. Social traders or anyone else that's interested in this area, social traders have yes. got the remit um, yeah. to work on advancing social procurement in that readiness and preparedness mm. space. Mm. So yeah, there's. I think it's. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of activity happening and a lot of people wanting to find their place and their role in the ecosystem. Um, I think, can I add to it? Yeah. There's also, if you think about individual business people, men and women, who've been very successful. And I found that um, someone said this to me, which is at this point, I mean, I'm only junior really in this world, but, you know, people back the jockey, not the horse. And, yeah. you know, in, as Victorians, you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but we, we, we kind of are thinking about the horse that we're delivering. But I think it's in the relationships that I've built um, that I couldn't have gotten to where I am today without certain business people deciding they wanted to in, do impact investment or even philanthropy really at this point. But they see my horse and go, whatever you want to do is great. Let's break it down. Mm. But I'm backing you. So, and I think that is about thinking through the individuals or the businesses that have the same values as you. And I think we get into a habit of thinking only about foundations or big grants and things like that. But really the networking process of building relationships with people, I think that's the greatest thing if there is lots of people who want to invest in the future and want to invest in change in this country. So if you can find them, um, they're actually they're, they're open. They want to listen to what you're up to. You know, they see it as a business investment but a social impact investment. So, yeah, I encourage that too. 
That's great. Thanks, Emily. Well, we've got about 10 minutes um, left of our session here this morning. I'm just going to share with you um, today just to show you a couple of quick things about how you can find more um, and connect in with our change maker coaches. So just quickly on our website, um, we have our 30 foundation members featured there. Um, they're featured as little heads on one page and you can click on those heads. Um, and it opens up with everyone has their own profile page. And you can see an example just there on the right hand side of Annette's profile page. Um, you can read in there about um, what Annette specialises in, a bit about um, her background. Ruth, Jody, and Emily all have their own profile pages as well. Um, some testimonials from people that they've worked with as well. And just gives you a feel for along the way if you do want to connect in with a change maker coach. Um, we've got really experienced people, pre-vetted people. Our community are all pre-vetted um, consultants um, and coaches. We only work with the best um, here at X Factor. So, yeah, feel free to have a little look there and, and find someone over time that might um, work well with you. Um, also, we have, a, we have some funny names in the X Factor Collective. We have the Concierge, which is a help desk that's there for you at any time. We have the Library, which has um, our blog in there, our community blog. And we also have uh, the Cafe. And the Cafe is um, based on this idea of a menu of great coaching packages and workshops that I'm just going to show you there that um, Ruth and Annette and Jody have um, got up in the cafe their coaching packages which you can have a look at and you can find out more and have a chat to them um, as well. So have a look through the cafe when you get a chance. There's lots of great uh, coaches in this area and other areas to connect in with. So just picking up on that idea of investment, we've got a question here that I'd love to get your um, perspective on, Annette, if that's okay, before we start to sort of wrap up. And it was a question we received on email over the last few days, which relates to keeping your original supporters that are there from the outset. Um, the question is, is my organisation is quite young and we have found that philanthropists who supported us at the start are proud of our impact and success, but they now want to fund the new shiny thing. How do we communicate to our donors that we need them to continue investing in our projects so that we can continue to make strong impact? I love your thoughts on that question, Annette. Sure. Um, so I really hear and understand that question. It's a big perennial question about um, multi-year funding and sustainability. Um, my first piece of advice is to always have a conversation with the funder at the outset about um, what, what's possible because, because, that, because I'm, I'm assuming this is a philanthropy question rather than a government question. Philanthropists are there, if they've got an office and they've got staff, they're there and they know, they know what they do and they don't do. So they'll, you could say to them, could we go for three year funding? Um, if it's just one year funding, can we come back next year? And often they'll be really frank and say, it's one year funding, but you can come back in a few years. So I, I would just follow their advice and they're often quite comfortable to give that advice. Um, it is, um, you know, a perennial debate in the sector about one-year project funding versus multi-year core funding. I'm a big advocate of multi-year core funding, um, but I really understand as well why they do the one year is because they want to be able to share their resources with other beneficiaries and because there is more demand than there is supply. So you can see where that's come from. Um, but I always ask for multi-year funding and I always ask for bigger, bigger dollars. I, I, I see a lot of grant seekers spending a lot of time, you know, pursuing a $5,000 grant, but it's the same amount of time and effort to go for a $50,000 to go to $100,000. And there's certainly there's opportunities out there. So that's one clever way of just put the effort in for the bigger amounts. Um, then I would just say, um, if you are wanting to pitch back to your original funders, then to pitch back to sort of say, what's new? You know, what have we achieved? We, we did this and now the next bit is this. Um, they won't always fund it, but it's, it's a way to sort of make it sound fresh and not just like ongoing funding. Um, and also to stay in touch during the funding. I often found that difficult as a grant seeker is to know how to keep in touch because sometimes it felt like a conveyor belt and we, set, we did our project, we sent her acquittal, but it was hard to keep in touch because they don't often turn up to events and 
So, but just don't ever underestimate the, the sort of benefit of a quick little email or a quick little photo or a little story that's just sent informally to keep that connection during the project rather than not having any contact and then sending an acquittal and asking for more money. Um, so, so super vital and small effort, you know, for big outcome. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is um, diversify, you know, um, do your research. There's a lot of funders and supporters out there. So I'd be putting a lot of, um, a lot of funding submissions out there, um, not only in philanthropy, but in government as well. Um, so yeah, like cast a wide net. Um, if you've got the time and resources, it's not too hard to find many other funders. Um, and then also the final thing I'd say is um, you want to be independent. You don't want to have 80 to 90% of your funding coming from um, philanthropy and government. So, and, and philanthropy and government will support you as well because they want to see you be more independent. So ask them those questions about um, diversifying your income streams. Where else can you go for funding? Can you start, you know, can you start up a social enterprise that you ask a funder to support? And often they will love to do that because that, they're seeing that as a pathway to your independence and your resilience and your self-reliance. So never stop asking those questions about where are we getting our funding from and how can we be more self-reliant? Um, yeah. That's great. That was a question that was asked anonymously. And if you're uh, here online with us this morning, hopefully that does give you some tips there. Um, feel free to stay connected with us. We do have some great sessions coming up on the 7th of November. Tisha Archer, who is an incredible major gifts fundraiser, will be um, online for a session and we'll be able to do some more, have some more conversation around donor engagement, re-engagement and things of that nature. So if you're here with us this morning, please come back and drop in and, and keep that conversation alive so we can help you. Um, we've got five minutes mm -hmm. till we wrap up and we've got one last thing that we would love, one last little gem that we'd love to get from our change maker coaches here this morning before we finish up. So um, looking for some tips, coaches. Um, it's hard to believe that it's coming to, towards the end of the year. And what suggestion, what tips do you have for people that are here today or watching this on our YouTube channel um, for them to start thinking about setting themselves up for, I can't believe I'm saying it, start setting themselves up yeah. for 2019? And how can they make 2019 their best year yet. So um, Jody, can I kick off with you? What would be your tips and suggestions? I would definitely encourage people to use any downtime that they might have over the holidays to, to have a good you know, moment to think about what's important to them. Um, breathe in deeply to sort of think about what's lighting them up, what's giving them joy, what are the things that they'd like to be doing differently. And then think about who are the support people who could help make that happen within your friendship circle, colleagues, people you've met at networking, um, whether it's engaging a change maker coach or whether it's just asking a friend to informally mentor and then reciprocating that. Um, ask for help and think about um, what are the steps you can take in order to make next year different and better and build on the great success from this year. Beautiful. So some quiet time and reflection time. That's a great, that's great advice. Um, Emily, what would be your tips on this area? It's so easy for me to say this, but you really need to make time for play and fun. <laughs> because you can get so serious and so in your head about what's the right way to do it and are we going to get the funding? Is this valuable? And if you haven't put a daily routine to meditate, have your apple cider vinegar, go for exercise. You are on a road to boring. <laughs> I thought you were going to say burnout, but road yeah. to boring. <laughs> Same thing, because then you can't be bothered playing or having fun with your family and friends. And I think there wouldn't be a woman or a change maker on here that says it's, you can avoid it by doing these tips. It's actually just learning each time that, yeah, play is is you that will spring from your rituals every day like i'm a massive fan beautiful beautiful good point ruth i think it's time to find some a few minutes to sit quietly and think about what am i what's happening within me that is some that is stopping me taking advantage of 
of possibilities and opportunities that might exist for me that I am too frightened uh, to think about in, in detail. Mm. I think we all have mm. places that we don't want to go. Mm. And they have enormous repercussions uh, in our, in our change maker, you know, professional lives and don't be too hard on yourself, but just sit down and think, you know, what is, what was going on when I didn't want to do that? Or what, 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 are, what are the, what's happening inside me that is, that is shutting me down at certain points? Mm, lovely. I like that. I don't, I need to make a little note for myself <laughs> listening to you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good reminder. Why, ladies, why? <laughs> um, and Annette, what about, what about your thoughts on this? Um, when I look at successful social entrepreneurs or, yeah, I, I, I would say that what they do is they have a number of ideas and they play. So talking about play, not so much only on the personal ritual level, but professionally. So test a few things because what I see to, seem to see happening is they, if you can lightly test a few things, usually one of them will like be like a fire ship, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll really happen. But Sometimes there's too much mental chatter, but it's like, what are the first few little steps I can take just to throw out some things into the world and see what flies? And particularly with the question about income streams and income diversification, mm. because if you can find something that, um, like even like I, I, in my local area, I noticed a charity has set up an, an op shop, um, gorgeous op shop. And I just popped in the other day and I said, how are you going? And they said, well, well we're, profit, we're making a $50,000 profit for our for our charity and it's like yeah you know and that would have been an idea that took a while but they just tested it and it's a success first year of operation so where that can become a big thing for them now so play with ideas and test them lightly without too much energy and resource and just see see what happens in terms of diversifying income because that's a big clincher to success and to rest and to not being overwhelmed is having some secure income streams Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, ladies, for those final tips and suggestions. Um, please feel free to drop a note in our chat box what your thoughts have been on today's session. It's been great having you here. It's 11.01. I can't believe it. I nearly hit the <laughs> 11 o'clock mark. 11 o'clock in Melbourne. Emily's off to catch um, a plane, so I'll let you drop out, Em, if you need to. Thank you so much, darling, for being here. Thank um, you for having me. What an honour. What a great hour together. What a great hour. Know, so thank you for preparing, Emily, Annette, Jodie, Ruth. Thank you for your time thank preparing you, for today. Um, it's been wonderful to have us all together. Such a great energy of being mm -hmm. together. And I think mm -hmm. this is a sign of, uh, for me, I think we should do plenty more of this. Okay. Um, so f please feel free to um, come into the next nine weeks of Ask X Factor Live. Um, please feel free to share it with people that you know. There is a downloadable PDF on our website. Um, I'll send you a link as well um, tonight. Um, on the back, it's got a full uh, list of, and a menu of um, who's mm -hmm. coming up over the next couple of months between now and Christmas. As you see, people like this, incredibly talented, experienced, um, heart smart people, I call us. We have uh, got the smarts, but we care. We care about you and we care about you achieving your social mission. Um, in a sustainable way. So thank you for being here today. Um, have a beautiful rest of your day and thanks a lot. Thanks, thank Ruth. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs>